Okay, so the theme for Asian Disorders uh, Awareness Week this year is Breaking the Stigma, Diverse Male Experiences with Asian Disorders and Body Image. And you see there uh, the hashtag to share uh, on social media. Now, I think it's so important to have um, this conversation um, and to shine a light on the issue of male body image concerns and eating disorders, because research indicates that one in seven men will experience an eating disorder by the age of 40. And um, research also indicates an increase in eating disorders and concerns about body image um, in men of all ages. And unfortunately, what we're seeing now in recent years is an increase in the number of preteen children in Ireland developing eating disorders um, as well, with rates as much as doubled in the last 10 years. So really, really serious. Um, and I suppose we do a lot of work in schools. Um, over the last couple of years, I have worked very closely with young people to deliver to, to develop uh, content uh, for schools programs, because it's, uh, it's really important that the content that we put out there is relevant and engaging for young Young people and I suppose uh, in order to do that in a way that uh, is effective. We have collaborated and worked very closely um, with young people and I suppose what has become very apparent in those conversations, in those workshops, um, is that body image is very much uh, uh, relevant to young men and that it's, they are very keen that we do talk about that. Um, and I will, towards the end uh, of the um, webinar today, talk about some of our schools programs and how you can access those. Um, and I suppose I think it's particularly important um, that we do break the stigma um, and talk about male experiences of body image and eating disorders, because there still is that belief that eating disorders are a female problem. Um, and that is part of the stigma faced by men. And I suppose what can happen as a result of that is that it can delay help seeking and lead to an eating disorder um, in particular becoming more entrenched. You know, and what we know is that the earlier that somebody gets help for an eating disorder, the more likely it is that they will make a full recovery and the easier it will be for them to, to do that. So it's really important, if possible, that we can promote awareness of eating disorders and um, that we can encourage young men to seek help as early as possible um, uh, so that they have the best chance of, of recovery. And I suppose our message really in today's webinar is one of hope. You know, I really, what I really want uh, and what we all really want is to um, send out the message that if you are experiencing an eating disorder um, and you are feeling really isolated in that, that you are not alone, that there is help available. And I think that's a really, really important message, that there are people who understand what you are going through um, and also that full recovery is possible. Um, you know, and uh, I think that's really, really important. So. Um, we have a great panel today. I'm really, really delighted to welcome you all. Um, we have Maeve O'Keefe, who, who will start first of all. Maeve, uh, as I said, is with the BodyWise Youth Panel. We have Barry Hennessy, um, and Barry will talk about his personal experience, as will Daniel O'Boyle, uh, Connor, and Connor Nolan. Uh, I will finish um, with some closing comments. Um, just, I suppose, to signpost to the Body Wise Support Services and just to indicate some of the different uh, other supports that Body Wise have, so supports for parents and also then um, just some details about our schools programmes. And then we will allow time at the end for questions um, as well. And as I said, we will try and get to as many of those questions as we can. And we we'll try and stick as, as closely as we can to the time frame as well. Um, so just to start off with um, Maeve, so just like to introduce Maeve. Um, Maeve uh, is a member of the BodyWise Youth Panel. Um, Maeve uh, completed a very interesting piece of research on male body image for her final year um, BA in Applied Psychology. So, you know, for her undergraduate uh, project. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Maeve, to outline some of the findings from your case studies on body image in our Irish men. I think it's really great to, to hear the kind of real world voices coming through in your research. Uh, I'll hand over to you now to share your screen, uh, Maeve, and go through your presentation. Thanks, Fiona. Um, one second now, I'm just gonna share. Um, yeah, so I assume you can see that okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so my name's Maeve, and as Fiona said, I'm on the youth panel for BodyWise, and this is just going to be a quick overview of some research I did for my final year project in UCC in body dissatisfaction in young Irish men. Um, so, yeah, one second now. Yep, 
Uh, yeah, so quickly I'll go through some kind of background and kind of motivation behind my research and then I'll give a quick overview of my results and I'll hone in on the role of media and the role of peers in particular. I'll chat a bit about masculine norms and then I'll go through some limitations in my study as well. Um, so first and foremost, I suppose I became interested in the issue of um, male body image through um, a project I did on body dysmorphia when I was in second year of college. Um, as a young woman, I suppose I was always conscious of body image pressures and the, the pressures that exist on, on women to have a certain physique. But I did feel a little bit insulated, even if not immune to these pressures, because of a growing conversation around uh, body positivity and an acknowledgement of how unattainable um, a very you know, thin physique is for most women. You know, when you look up body image online, it, it refers predominantly to women. But body image pressures don't discriminate on the basis of sex and men can experience and they do experience huge levels of body dissatisfaction, um, levels of disordered eating, orthorexia, body dysmorphia, muscle dysmorphia, all these things. Exposure to appearance related pressures is no less relentless for men, but the conversation and the research is, is lagging. Now it's catching up, but, but definitely something that I wanted to explore more and I wanted to understand more the influences on body image in young men and how these manifest in exercise and behaviours and eating behaviours. So I suppose the reasons why this, this kind of research is so important is because the prevalence of men presenting with eating disorders is increasing at such a rapid rate, but the research consistently shows that young men are kind of least likely of all different demographics to seek help for mental health concerns. And, you know, these concerns include um, eating disorders. Um, so for my study, I chatted to nine men aged between 18 and 25 about body image, body dissatisfaction, their motivations to exercise. And these interviews varied in length from 20 to 50 minutes. And then I did a thematic analysis of the interviews. Um, I don't have time to go through my results very thoroughly, but you can see here that sociocultural influences on body image was my first theme, which then had the sub themes of media, romantic partners and peers. And these were all things that I saw as influencing and impacting on my participants body image. And then we have the perceived attainability of the ideal physique, um, which came down to kind of how young men were accessing fitness information and how trustworthy they found this information to be. So be it through like online fitness accounts, that kind of thing. And then on the other hand, they had the social cost of pursuing the ideal physique. So does, you know, does it mean that, yes, I'll have a six pack, but I'm missing going out with my friends because I'm worried about the, the calorie intake or I'm worried about, you know, making up the next day in the gym, that kind of thing. Um, then we have sport and athletic performance as a motivator, which came down to things like the role of coaches and fitness regimes and plans that come with being part of a, a team. And then finally, um, we had interpersonal motivation. So the kind of really positive things that impact body image and um, the sense of satisfaction that can come with being physically active and eating well and just the physical and mental health benefits that come with that. Um, so yeah, perhaps kind of unsurprisingly, um, media was frequently referred to as an influence on body image for my participants. It was kind of seen to inform their understanding of what the ideal body type is. So they kind of internalized this very lean, muscular body type. Um, as this guy said, no one's going to want to see Zac Efron with the dad bod. And, you know, they specifically referred to the likes of Love Island, Perfume Ads, Marvel movies, Thor, Instagram accounts. And they said, you know, it's in your face so often that this is how young men should look. And they you know, said it's, it's hard to be confident in your own body then. Um, but that said, I think that the role of peers was what I found to be the most prominent influence on body image for my participants. Um, peers represent a very kind of salient influence because they are seen to represent a realistic ideal to compare yourself to. Whereas like athletes and actors and influencers were sort of seen as being paid to look a certain way, whereas your peers and the guys that you're socializing with, it was it was more directly, directly able to compare yourself um, with them when it came to, to physique and body image concerns. Um, so a huge aspect of the influence of peers came down to casual comments made about each other's bodies. Many of the participants spoke to me about 
slagging and banter between male friends where remarks about weight were really common. People would say, oh, your man has a dad bod or, you know, slagging off the, the heavier guys, slagging off the lighter guys, all these kind of remarks that were completely normalized and were seen as very lighthearted and in jest, but definitely conveyed kind of certain certain ideas about body image and what was desirable. Um, alongside these kind of more overt remarks, there was a more insidious silent element of social comparison, which often took place in changing rooms or in the gym. Um, this participant spoke to me and he said that as soon as you step into the gym, you're immediately comparing yourself to others. You know, you're looking at how much others are bench pressing, how much they're squatting. And he said that surrounding yourself in an environment where guys are all different shapes and sizes, you can't help but compare yourself. So this kind of um, idea of social comparison could feel really inescapable for some of my participants. Um, and while the participants maintained that slagging about weight in their peer groups was lighthearted messing, they also said that more serious conversations about body image and body dissatisfaction simply wouldn't happen in their peer groups because of kind of this stigma, a silent culture and a reluctance to show signs of weakness or vulnerability. Um, the expression of body image concerns generally were sort of seen as somewhat emasculating, which brings me to the theme of kind of masculine norms in peer groups. Um, even in the interviews, a lot of my participants would preface their comments by saying, this might sound weird or like, don't judge me. And then, you know, they might talk to me and be really open with me. And then they'll conclude by saying, maybe that's just me. Um, I don't know, you, you definitely want to talk to other people because that might just be me. I, I don't know, don't judge me, all this kind of thing. They were constantly undermining the issue. Um, which which I found you know really interesting or saying like oh girls girls definitely have it worse that kind of thing um, and broaching body image concerns was just generally reserved for kind of very superficial comments about each other's physiques or else in a kind of pragmatic way of like oh I see that you've lost weight what did you do for that but they wouldn't actually talk about the insecurities underpinning these these kind of conversations um, and as well as that, the muscular body type in particular was seen as inferring a lot of status, social status. It was associated with being like really, you know, an alpha male, a sex symbol, someone who dominates every situation. And you have to wonder, is it this kind of very hyper muscular, strong model of masculinity that not only causes, you know, body insecurity and body dissatisfaction with, with guys who don't have that physique, but also inhibits them from getting help for their mental health concerns. Like think of all these expressions, you know, the strong, silent man, very stoic, boys don't cry, all these old expressions. So it definitely, it definitely, you know, there's definitely progress being made in terms of challenging these outdated kind of norms, but at the same time, we have a long way to go for sure. Um, and then, yeah, just to finish up, I'll just go through some of the limitations of my study. Obviously it was just for an undergrad degree. Um, the study is not supposed to be representative of all Irish men. It's kind of just a snapshot of the experiences of my participants. And yeah, you shouldn't be seen to represent men generally by any stretch. Um, there's definitely more scope to research the experiences of men from the LGBT plus community. And as well as that, this study focused primarily on physique concerns among men. But um, definitely like body image is such a multifaceted kind of construct and future studies could look at hair loss, height, skin, teeth. These are all areas that, you know, there, there are kind of body image concerns among men that, you know, also need to be addressed and, and looked at. Um, and then finally, as a woman, that may have influenced the, the tone of the interviews and the analysis to an extent. Um, whether for the better or the worse, it's kind of hard to say, but definitely, um, you know, you kind of have to be reflexive when it comes to this kind of um, research. But yeah, that's that's everything I have to say. Thanks. I'll hand back over to Fiona now. Great. Um, thank you so much, Maeve. I think that's a really interesting study, really interesting. Um, you know, and I think a lot of things, a lot of the themes that you've expressed there would have come up in our own body wise uh, research. And I think some of the imagery that you've included there, you know, uh, it, it, I think it, it's really important um, to see that, too. And I think definitely the the pressure is there from a very, very young age, you know, and as a parent, I'm acutely aware of that. 
Um, and I suppose it's what we're hearing from teachers as well, you know, what we in fact heard from teachers in primary school was that they uh, are, you know, they're, they're surprised at the language that even children in the infant classes have around body image um, and that even, um, you know, children in junior infants and senior infants would use terms like six pack when they're talking about male bodies. And that really, I suppose, goes to show us um, how much this is filtered down, you know, and, and how important it is for us to have these conversations and uh, to be able to counteract and support young people um, and, and men uh, of all ages um, in challenging some of these negative pressures um, and, and opening up uh, to, to seeking help as well. So, so, so important. So um, Barry Hennessy, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, Barry is a four-time uh, All-Ireland uh, winner, uh, winning hurler with Limerick. And um, Barry has recently retired from hurling and is a qualified personal trainer and nutrition coach, helping people have positive relationships with themselves. Uh, Barry is also a proud father to his two daughters, um, which Barry describes as his uh, greatest accolade. So it's so lovely to have you here with us today, Barry. Um, Thanks, Barry. And- yeah, and I, I'm delighted you could join us. And if you'd like to just open by, um, I know that you've shared your experience now a few times, and um, I, I, I'm, it's it's great that you have. And uh, if you would just like to to open by maybe telling us a bit about your own personal experience. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, Fiona. Um, I think people might be sick of me talking about this over the last couple of months, but uh, I suppose everything that may have spoke about there uh, can resonate with me because. Um, you know, nearly line for line. That was probably similar to my case. Uh, I was probably a little bit before uh, the social media side of things with the Instagrams and the whole lot. But I would have found that towards the end of secondary school, especially for me, that um, the whole bodybuilding scene probably took off a little bit again in terms of magazine, websites, inside of that. And just fell into um, hook, line, sinker for that narrative of this is the way uh, a man should look like. So I suppose the, the social pressures from that side of it, um, I would have felt that the fact that I was an athlete as well, that there was a perceived way that I'd have to look. Um, and I suppose, look, that started at kind of 17, 18 years of age for me, that I was uh, aware that I was probably, uh, I don't, didn't look the same as the rest of the lads, you know, I probably carried a little bit more weight and that added that pressure in it as well. So um, I would have spent a lot of time in my late teens, early 20s on things like bodybuilding.com or buying magazines where you see all these guys, these six packs and you're saying to yourself, you know, that's normal. How do I get to there? Um, and it just turned, it kind of turned from, from there really for me, turned in a drastically bad way for me where it led to a bout of bulimia, uh, a fairly bad bout of bulimia to be honest for maybe three or four years that uh, we're trying to hide that and play high performance sports at the same time. Um, and look, because I had, because I'd said to myself, this is the, this is the norm, this is the way I'm supposed to look like, you know, this was, um, this was the way I'm perceived to be, that I just had convinced myself that I was doing the right thing by, you know, binging and purging, um, avoiding food, avoiding events, like my episode there, I went out of my way uh, to get out of family events, get out of team events, with the lads, every sort of way, use fitness to, to nearly abuse myself then, um, if I did go to an event, you know, I was counting all those calories and counting all those meals and things I was eating um, mm-hmm. and was using fitness then um, you know, to counteract that when I shouldn't have been. Mm-hmm. So um, it was probably, look, it was a, a difficult cycle at the time um, and I suppose trying to hide it. I've mm-hmm. gone on record and saying that um, I've been to family events and you know, birthday parties and unfortunately, you know, we would slip away to the bathroom and do whatever I did in the bathroom then come back and just act as if it was normal. Um, mm-hmm. And that's just become just a way of life for me for the bones of four or five years, you know, that I, I perceive that to be normal. Um, mm-hmm. And look, it all was then back to the baby, my parents separating and having maybe a little bit of um, mental health difficulties that I didn't address at the time and not having a mm-hmm. conversation with someone. Um, and just being really, I suppose, stubborn in one way, but on the mm-hmm. other side of it, being really embarrassed that mm-hmm. I was going through this um, and didn't want to be perceived as a problem. Are, are weak um you know and that if i had opened up to someone about this what would they think about me you know so there's that insecurity i suppose and you know that lack of confidence to to come forward mm-hmm. um but i know myself now on reflection um speaking out about it especially in the last couple of months just nearly an acceptance mm-hmm. to me that i had a problem 
um mm. that I didn't address you know and mm. like I would encourage anyone that is going through something or having similar thoughts even nip it straight away if you can and just speak to someone because I know myself that um my my problem would have you know probably been in, in terms of time frame would have been cut in half if I'd spoken to someone you know and it wouldn't have festered for as long as it did um and even up to today if you want to like over the last few years even mm-hmm. um you know you're you're still taking kind of day by day uh, in terms of certain things you know but you can kind of see those traits and tendencies that you be mm-hmm. very very careful that if you don't speak to someone and address it you know you can slip back into into really bad habits um probably yeah, found true. the last two years especially being uh from the body image side of things um mm-hmm. like my two girls are probably the, the best thing to, to ever happen to me but yeah on the other side of it then you see how I looked in terms of physique before I had two kids and where I am now mm-hmm. and look in the back of your head that is you do have that little bit of a dead body you know and there's that acceptance then mm-hmm. that you've that you're after doing something wonderful and bringing these two beautiful girls into the world but then there's that selfish element in the back of your head from past experience mm-hmm. of this is the way you used to look like you know come on cop on now a little bit like so so even yeah. though it's been a blessing it's been really hard as well you know so um yeah. what I, I find out I'm able to articulate my feelings and speak to people you know and it, it just helps me Mm-hmm. Just nip it in the bud so I don't fall into the bad experiences. Um, that's yeah. a really streamlined version of it, Fiona. <laughs> but I don't want too much more of it. That is, it's just brilliant, Barry. It's so, it's so powerful to hear what you have to say. So, so powerful. And you know, and, and I suppose you've touched on so many points that there that are so valuable. And I suppose one is that you know, an eating disorder and the behaviors around food are only one aspect. And it's really so much deeper than that. And it really is about the feelings. And it's a for the person, it's a way of coping with difficult feelings and um and, and that that's the aspect that needs to be addressed. Um and uh and and I think it's really powerful that you mentioned as well that even though you are recovered, that those pressures, you know, that, that we're surrounded by pressures, you know, and and that they're prevalent um for people of all ages, you know, and that it's not just a teenage thing. Um, and, and I suppose, you know, now nowadays with social media, and I did, certainly didn't grow up with social media, but it, it's really increased the pressure, you know, and what we hear from talking to young people in the focus groups that we work with is that body image concerns in boys and men are prevalent. You know, most young men will experience body image concerns at some stage and it's very easy and I suppose I know this from my work it's very easy once that disordered eating creeps in if you are struggling with some emotional issue and we all have things that are difficult to cope with from time to time it's very easy for that to cross over and for the behaviors around food to become you know compulsive it's it's easy for that to happen so this conversation is so important for us to to have um, and uh, it's great to hear your advice there at the end around, um, you know, if you had spoken up that little bit earlier, um, that your your recovery time might have been halved. Um, Barry, you it spoke to me when when we spoke on the phone. You said to me that, um, you know, when you did your initial uh, a podcast talking about your experience, you weren't expecting anybody to really hear it or tune in, and that you were really taken aback by the avalanche. Uh, of contacts that you received following that so feedback from people from all walks of life would you be able to just tell me a little bit about that please and maybe what who got in contact what type of people or who did you hear from yeah and I suppose naivety was it's a great thing uh, if you want I, I just thought it was going to be just there and that was it and there wouldn't be much from it um probably led to a couple of radio interviews television etc um but I suppose as I said previously in my opinion it was a bit disappointing that it took someone with a couple of medals behind him come forward for you know the spotlight to be cast in this again when really there's there's thousands and thousands of people suffering in Ireland. It was wrong in my opinion that it just took it took someone with medals, as I said, to come forward. But um but it just showed after after I did that uh, the messages just started flooding in that you had people that are involved in high performance sports, be it mm-hmm. actual athletes themselves or ex-athletes. Um, some whose careers were cut short by similar ex- experiences that they had no one they felt they could go out at the time, um, both male and female. Um, there was high performance nutritionists mm-hmm. um, that are involved in professional sports um, in, in Ireland currently at the moment. And they could see it themselves. They said that there's a fine line there between where some of the athletes are at and 
going into to deep waters in terms of an actual eating disorder that they can see that um, athletes are very, very obviously driven to, to get to a certain level of performance. But on the other side of it, then they will take drastic measures to get there uh, mm-hmm. in terms of what they have to do. So they can see that they're they're constantly trying to bring guys back from, and ladies back from the, that line and make sure that they don't cross it. Um, members of the defence forces um, that I would have went to school with, again, someone that you would never thought that would have had mm-hmm. an issue um, had said to me that, you know, we were going through something similar at the time and it's a pity we didn't know that you were, you know, that there was a couple of us involved that could have helped each other out, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even down to, to the families, Fiona, um, there was a couple of families that got in touch to say that they had 11 and 12 year old daughters that were going through something at the moment that they didn't know what to do. You know, there, were, there was no support there that was affecting the whole family and like things like that. So it's, it's very hard to hear. Um, but it was nice then when I said look, that um, obviously it helped, may have helped their situation, you know, when, when you came forward and spoke about it. Um, so it was nice to, to touch base with those people and anyone that had contacted me, I, I made sure to try and get back to everyone because um, mm-hmm. for someone to take the courage to reach out, like I know myself, it's, it's massive, you know. So um, I appreciated all the well wishes and um, tried my best then hopefully to give back to people as well. So. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And I suppose, you know, what I really, you know, come away from that, just what you said there, um, thinking and feeling is that, you know, there is no one type of person who has an eating disorder that really all walks of life, you know, people in all different kinds of jobs, people of all ages are affected by eating disorders. Um, And it's always very, very difficult to take that first step and to ask for help. Um, but you are not alone you know and that so many people are going through similar and there is support and we see Barry here and Daniel here and Connor who have come through eating disorders and at the other side and are recovered and able to move on with their lives and I suppose that is is so so powerful so um, thank you so much Barry um, and thanks for taking the time to join us Um, and I'll I'll be in contact with you again Barry so thanks so much thanks Fiona Okay, so we are going to move on uh, to uh, Daniel and Daniel O'Boyle. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Daniel. Thank you uh, for having me. It's, it's, it's an honour to be asked to come on here today. Well, it, it's it's an honour to have a, a webinar like today, isn't it? I just think it's it's so needed. Um, I think you know, just events like this can really open up conversations and, and particularly when we've got the full week um, with this theme and um, it's really powerful and can really affect a lot of positive change I think you know so 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 important um, and just to introduce Daniel uh, Daniel is a trainee solicitor from County Mayo um, but now based in Dublin um, and Daniel appeared in the documentary Unspoken which aired on RTE in 2021 and which focused on male sufferers of eating disorders and I saw Daniel and it was really Just brilliant. And again, just another step in the right direction to encourage people to open up. Um, And since then, uh, Daniel has advocated for better societal understanding of eating disorders and the recovery process and for improving services for people with eating disorders, particularly in rural locations. And and I think, again, that's so important. Um, So, Daniel, um, if you're happy to just tell us a little bit about your experience as well, please. Yes, I think... um kind of um similar to, to what Barry was saying um when I was I, I can kind of think back to when my first I suppose eating disorder behavior started displaying and it would have been when I was around eight years old so quite a quite a, an early age and, and quite a long time ago and um, but then during my teenage years I think is is when everything kind of I suppose peaked um and it would have been kind of <clears throat> and it, it was almost like the perfect storm because just as my eating disorder was becoming worse. It was the time when it was very common on television to have um, particular shows where like The Biggest Loser or the shows like that where like people, where, where fat people are, and things like that were, were criticized and were lambasted. And, you know, it was almost seen as being socially acceptable to mock these people on television for viewing. Um, and I, I distinctly remember when I was early, in my early teens, um, I said to a friend of mine that I was thinking of like starting to count calories. And this friend laughed and said, oh, Daniel, well, sure, that's something that girls do. He's like, you know, look, girls count calories and, and not you. But the funny thing is, then only a few years later, it would have been around the time that shows like Geordie Shore and Jersey Shore started kind of airing on television. 
it's it's almost like a, a, a switch was flicked in a lot of my peers and even in me where it was kind of like oh no you have to have you have to look this way and you have to have a six pack and it was purely for aesthetic purposes it was for no other reason it wasn't for just wanting to improve your general fitness and stuff so then when when that when that happened it then became very easy to hide what was an eating disorder behind the facade of i'm doing this for fitness purposes like this is this is purely for fitness i'm counting calories for fitness purposes and and i suppose i i, I have a, a somewhat of a, a unique perspective in terms of like I, in my teenage years, I was, I was quite overweight. And so, and then I, after the eating disorder, I was quite underweight. So it was like the both opposite ends of the, ends of the spectrum. And what I find interesting looking back was when I started losing weight initially, that I, from when I was overweight, I was only met with compliments and it was only met with, oh, this is wonderful and this is great and you look great. And it was all about how you looked aesthetically. And then once I started, I, I, I suppose, seeping into towards being underweight and, and being visibly, looking very visibly unwell, was then there, I was only met with huge concern and I was only met with dying, this has to stop, everything like that. And, but, but the, the funny thing is, is that the behaviors never changed. So when I initially started losing weight, the behaviors, I mean, the behaviors obviously became, became a lot worse, but the actual behaviors never changed from when I was living in a bigger body to when I was in a far, far smaller body. So I think that as important as it is to stress that an eating disorder doesn't discriminate on the basis of one's gender. So we're, we're three men that have experienced it. It also doesn't discriminate on the basis of one's size. You know, someone's size isn't necessarily an indicator of what they're suffering with eternally. Um, so then I would have, um, suppose kind of got to a stage where I was so fearful of putting on weight that the only way I knew that I could not put on weight was by continuing to lose weight. So I kind of put myself, I was unfortunately then in a position where I was quite unwell, where I wasn't eating, where I wasn't nourishing my body and where I was doing ferocious amounts of exercise. Um, and bringing it back, I suppose, to body image is that I said that the goalposts were always moving. So it was always like, once I hit this certain weight target, or once I look this certain way, or once this part of my body looks a little bit better, then I'll stop and then I'll, 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 I'll be okay. But no matter what, but, but as, as the eating disorder got worse, my self-perception was completely thwarted. I had no idea to, of, of what I even really looked like, you know? And it was almost like I would stand in the mirror and recognize, oh no, Daniel, you, you, look, you look quite unwell and be upset about the fact that I look so unwell because I'd lost so much weight and so un underweight but then also saying to myself but but tough you you, you have to keep going there's, there's no alternative to kind of putting on there's no alternative the only alternative is to put on weight and, and that was the the fear always was always how I would appear and, and my view of myself so definitely as as it, it, it's it's a vicious cycle because as I was saying you know as the disorder becomes worse your perception of yourself becomes worse and you you, you don't really have an idea of, of what you look like because your brain is so starved of, of any sort of nutrients yeah. but yeah i think i think what's what's really important is you know documenting um the recovery process so now i'm i'm recovered and in a, mm -hmm. in a very very good place in terms of food and body and everything like that and mm -hmm. um, and it, it was recognizing that i was co consistently conflating my self-worth with my body image so it would almost be used as a way of like calming me down so I would almost so if I was going through a particularly stressful period in life it would be like oh well it's fine because I can like still I still look this way or I'm still weigh this much whatever like that and it was recognizing that that was not a healthy coping mechanism that, that was not a coping me mechanism at all but it was certainly not a healthy co coping mechanism mm -hmm. So it was recognizing that it was necessary then to kind of employ some new coping mechanisms um, and to recognize that irrespective of what my body looks like, I still have a considerable amount of worth as a person, as does everyone. Um, mm -hmm. So it was kind of rec recognizing that myself and re recovery, I think is, um, I've always kind of maintained that it is, it, it's like a, a discovery of, of the person that has always been there, the, the person that didn't have any of this condition. So that person that was within me before I became eight years old and the eating disorder, I suppose, started to, to come into effect. And finding that has been nothing short of, of, a, of, an, of a wonderful experience. I mean, it has been um, difficult at times and it's a, it's a lengthy experience. It's, it's not something that, that happens overnight. Um, and it, it's, it's taken me, me quite a number of years, a few years to get to this point. Um, but it, it was definitely a, a worthy, an absolutely worthy experience because it, without, without wanting to sound dramatic, it, it's, it saved my life, but it also gave me my life back, um, which I think is the most important part. Yeah. And, and Daniel, there is just so much in what you've said 
Um, and I'm glad because everybody's touching on, you know, slightly different points um, and, and also valuable. And it's interesting that you just said, you know, you, you know, at that time. So first of all, I suppose what's uh, what's what's interesting is that you, you indicated that from the age of eight, which most people would probably be really shocked to hear that. But that's what that's what we're hearing. You know, we're hearing, I suppose, from from primary school teachers um, as well. You know, so these uh, concerns do start at, at a, uh, sometimes at a preteen age. Um, you know, but but it's interesting there what you said about media ideas and that suddenly at the time that you were a teenager, you know, when there's uh, oftentimes there that's a time of body image concern mm. anyway, isn't it? And mm. um, that we had Geordie Shore and the likes of those programs mm. um, and that the media ideas were, were really dominating and they seemed to be kind of everywhere. Mm. And I suppose that's really what we're hearing from young men at the moment is that you kind of, you know, you can't get away from these pressures. And people would say things like, it's never far from my mind, you know, so this body ideal, even though I can't get there, even though I'm not going to look like that, this is what I hear from young men, um, it's never far from my mind. So it's really important that we talk about that pressure. And what I think you've touched on there, um, and, and all of what you said is, is just so valuable, um, but just to, to touch on a few things, you indicated something there, and I think this is really, really important too, is that in, in terms of your recovery, that there was the overcoming the eating disorder, and then there was also the additional piece around body image and yeah. finding yeah. your self-worth uh, separate to that, you know, and, yeah. and, and separating the two. And for me, I think that's very, very important because um, I do think there are two different components to recovering from an eating disorder. I think, of course, there is, you know, overcoming the eating disorder behaviors and getting back to a healthy weight and getting back to managing your feelings differently. But it's also taking a step away from that, isn't it? And um, reconnecting with your body. And I suppose what we see with body image concerns and with an eating disorder is that, um, and you said it there, that the exercise became almost like a form of punishment. And because it becomes so extreme, um, you know, and, and, and rigid, the behaviors around food and exercise are so rigid, people often feel very disconnected from their bodies. So it's around reconnecting with their bodies, listening to their bodies again, building a supportive relationship where they look after themselves and where their self-worth is, as you said, separate to, um, to how they look which is, yeah. is really vital. Would you like to say any more on that? No, no I was just saying that I, I think it's, it's also important to recognise. I mean, I, I know I'd, I'd said it at the beginning just in relation to those shows that used to air on television and stuff. And mm -hmm. the fact that those shows don't really exist anymore, I think is an indication of the way that we're going. I mean, something like that just wouldn't even be socially acceptable now to air television mm -hmm. or like that. So I think that it's important that we don't understate how important each member of us is, uh, each of us is as a member of society. And it's so important that we recognise that how we speak about ourselves how we speak about other people and their bodies has such an impact upon what the, you know particularly the younger generation it has such an impact upon what they hear so I definitely think that it's important that while we all you know continue to I suppose overcome our own body image issues it's really important mm -hmm. to recognize that everyone does kind of we, we do share a collective responsibility in how the next gen the generation behind us views themselves in that regard as well. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, th I think it's so vital and that's part of the work that we have been doing with young people as well. And, and in fact, in the last couple of years, so we have the BodyWise website, which is dedicated to eating disorders. And we've actually got a totally separate website ar around promoting positive body image, which looks at things like that, which looks at the way that we talk about our bodies, turning the focus away from body image and the conversations that we have about other people as well. And uh, lots of positive stuff there around kind of challenging some of the um, pressures that people would experience. So um, we have we the, the two separate websites as well and I, I'll provide the links to those at the end and um, you also said something very important there and um, just around that reckon you know um size is not an indicator mm -hmm. of somebody having an eating disorder I think that's really really important for us to stress um, and you know a, a person can be within their healthy weight range and be really in the throes of a, a very difficult eating disorder so um, it's important that we don't define their wellness um, by how they appear to us from the outside because it's not an indicator and I think that's really important so um, Daniel thank you so much um, and we, we will be having questions at the end. So if, if you're able to, to stay with us, that would be great. Um, and uh, um, I'm just going to move on to Connor. Um, so thank you, uh, Connor. So delighted to have you here uh, with us today. And I know that 
uh, some of the themes there that Daniel has brought up are, are themes that will be, um, you know, are, are very relevant to some of the conversations that I have had with you as well. Um, and I suppose particularly, you know, being from, from rural Ireland and something that you would have talked about um, uh, in, in some of the videos that I've watched of you previously um, was, you know, around the kind of mould or norms or expectations. Um, so I'm just going to uh, give a little bit of background on Connor. So Connor Nolan. And um, so Connor studied theoretical phys physics at the University of Galway and is now working as a software engineer. Uh, Connor is the author of Normal, um, which was released in August 2020, um, uh, about his personal experience with an eating disorder um, as, a, as a very young man. Um, and uh, Connor is now a public speaker in schools and colleges around uh, Ireland. And Connor is originally from Cavan, like myself. I am indeed, I am indeed. <laughs> and now living in uh, in Newry. So thank you so much for joining us today, Connor. Um, and if you're happy to just start and tell us a little bit about, about your story, please. Perfect, thank you. Thanks for having me as well. Um, I suppose, as, as Daniel said there, my uh, my journey, I suppose, are the origins of some of my sort of eating disorder behaviours would have also started um, very, very young. And like, as a young man, I suppose like a lot of young men, I had a great interest in the GEA. I loved Gaelic football. And, you know, I wanted to be, I suppose, the best player I could be. And there was a great love for sport there. There was an eagerness to, I suppose, perform as well as I could. And within that, there was great motivation to I suppose, push myself in, in an athletic sense. And as, as Daniel said there about the sort of eating disorder behaviours creeping in and sort of like behind a kind of a positive motive, you know, I started off with the positive motive of becoming fitter and stronger as a, as a footballer. But over time, these sort of negative, this negative relationship with food and body image and sort of exercise behaviours began to creep in. But given this was the goal I had in, in, in sport, it was very easy for that to kind of go unnoticed, e even to me as well. So this behaviour started off around the age of, of 10 or 11, and it began to get, I suppose, very bad around the, the start of um, of secondary school. And one thing I've learned from, from counselling, even going back as an adult, is that one of the things that can trigger be, like behaviours related to eating disorders in people is periods of change. And when I look back, it was that, transition from primary to secondary school where I really saw like a downhill spiral with regard to the eating disorder. Uh, thankfully, and one thing I talk a lot about in, in speeches and in my book is the power of counselling with regard to helping people in these situations. I, you know, thank, I know counselling resources can be quite limited in Ireland in the present day. I suppose maybe back in, this was maybe 2011 when I was going through to this, I did get publicly available counselling very, very quickly. And I spent about 12 months in counselling as a, as a 13 year old and I can honestly say and again not to sound dramatic it really is life changing and there's, there's one there's a part of my book where I it's a very simplified example but I compare the brain to like a car's engine and I compare a counsellor or a psychologist to a mechanic and I, one this was very uh, well renowned psychologist in this country has read my book and they complimented the simplicity of that comparison it, it does sound very dumbed down but even in hindsight, I can kind of see how, how that works. It's I, I found it remarkable how how different I was as a young man entering counselling and you know how I was coming out. And thankfully, you know, since that sort of experience when I was around 12, 13, 14, my relationship with food has been very, very positive. And um, thankfully, you know, my road to recovery was quite quick in, in comparison to, to some people. And, you know, I, as I got into my later teenage years and into my early 20s, my relationship with food and, and body image has been quite positive. But one thing I found sort of surprising is that I have seen my mental health act up at different times in my late teens and early 20s. And I've only learned from going back to counselling as an adult that there are, I suppose, behaviours relating to anxiety and sort of obsessive behaviours that are related to an eating disorder that, that can act up and cause problems in our lives, you know, even without it just being a body image and a, a being related to food sort of thing. So that's one thing I really try and raise an awareness to is that if you have suffered with an eating disorder in the past, these behaviours can creep up in later life, even if it doesn't manifest itself in the physical sense. And that's something to be very aware of in the sense that our, you know, recovery and looking after our mental health is, is very much an, an ongoing thing in that sense. So that's something I also try and promote. The other thing as well is, a big part of my work is with regard to, I suppose, raising awareness for families. 
you know, it's very hard on a family as a whole. I, I think uh, Barry mentioned that as well. When, especially when a younger child uh, goes through a battle with their mental health, whether it be an eating disorder or otherwise, a family can come under a lot of pressure and a family, particularly I suppose it's parental nature to, to blame themselves. I really try and show families that, you know, these things aren't anyone's fault in a sense, there's no one to blame and that they are something that can be, you know, worked through and, and, and recovery is possible. And I suppose, a, a, a health, you know, a healthier life does lie ahead for, for the young person in, in that sense. Yeah. Connor, you know, I'm brilliant again, and I just think that's so valuable. Um, just just to hear that about counselling and and talking therapies like that can be so valuable for people. Um, and I think it's also really valuable just you know for you to be so honest about the fact that even you know though the eating disorder you had left behind, um, that you know some aspects of mental health, you know, as we're we're human. Um, and different Absolutely. things can arise from time to time. Um, and it's really important that we are tuned into ourselves and that we um, are proactive in supporting our own wellness. Um, and I think it's important at, at any stage in our lives um, when things crop up um, to, to speak to somebody about that. And it's really valuable to get that conversation started um, and to encourage people to do that. You also mentioned something hugely uh, valuable there as well, Connor. Well, all of it was, all of it was, and thank you so much. Um, but you mentioned, uh, and, and I suppose with something that we're very aware of, is that often uh, an eating disorder will arise at a time of transition like that, you know, during periods of change when somebody is presented with a new set of circumstances and maybe some kind of difficulty that they don't know how to deal with. And that, you know, the eating disorder then starts as a way, um, you know, the, uh, the way that they use to, to cope with those difficult feelings. Um, and obviously it's not a, a good way of coping. It's not a helpful way of coping, but, but that's how it comes about. Um, and you mentioned in particular that transition from primary school to secondary school. Um, and we would often hear that. And, um, you know, I suppose we're acutely aware of that. And because of that, um, Body Hoys have developed a schools program um, intended for first year students. Um, and uh, it's for first year stu students in secondary school. And um, the idea being that, you know, they're they, to, to facilitate that transition from primary to secondary, to talk about the difficult subjects around body image um, and self-esteem and to open the conversation um, and so also promote awareness uh, of eating disorders. And we're also aware, I suppose, that nowadays a lot of young people would also um, along, you know, at the time that they start secondary school would also be given a, a smartphone, you know, and that brings, I suppose, it's own set of challenges uh, with it and, and maybe exacerbates uh, body image pressure and um, so it's really really important to hear that uh, as well and um, uh, Connor thank you so much would you have any do you have any additional uh, advice I suppose um, for young men maybe who, who are going through something similar you know any advice for them? Uh, absolutely and, and I suppose one thing to say on that you mentioned before I started there about the whole idea of the mold sorry I kind of glanced over yeah. that I went off on a tangent yeah. there uh, like one thing I noticed was uh, in my teenage years is that and this is where in an ironic sense the title of my book normal comes from I felt that you know it wasn't normal or, or the dumb thing for a young man to to suffer with his mental health and thankfully nowadays there are gentlemen like ourselves you know raising awareness on this so it's my advice to young men is if you are struggling whether it be with an eat disorder or otherwise don't be afraid to reach out and get help and don't get caught in this thought process that you know, it's only me going through this, none of the other young men. Like from a statistical point of view, it may be a case that to the naked eye, none of the other young men in your circle are suffering with something like you, but there could be something else they're going through. There could be anxiety, there could be anything there at all. So just, you know, just because you don't think other people are going through something like this, don't be afraid to reach out and get help. And I suppose my other final remark, and this does sound somewhat cliche, but I've, I've often been asked, you know, if I had some advice for my 13 year old self, what would it be? And the advice in a nutshell is, to keep going because I think as the two as Daniel and Barry both said there is a life and a wonderful life beyond you know uh, problems with our mental health and you know as as Daniel said there it's almost about like rediscovering the person you were before the the eating disorder crept in and there is a there's a wonderful journey to that and that's mm -hmm. why I would say to anyone is that keep going because you've you've no idea the life that lies on the far side of, of your recovery so really just keep going and do not be afraid to ask for help. Brilliant.
Brilliant. Thank you so much, Connor. Thank you so much. Um, and, and just something that you, you said there just reminded me of, you know, so in, in over the last couple of years, we've been working with young people in very small focus groups to really get a sense of the body image pressures. And one of the guys in one of our earlier focus groups, Jake, uh, who was 18 at the time, uh, he, he articulated just what you've said there as well. He said, you know, if he was sitting in on a Friday night and he wasn't in good form and because he was on wasn't in good form, he was scrolling through social media. He said very easy, first of all, to feel like he's the only one who's sitting in, who's sitting in because it looks like everybody's out having a ball and um, anybody who's out doing something is posting and you're not noticing the people who are not posting. And he said very, very easy as well to feel like you're the only one who's not coping because it looks like everybody's doing so well, because that's what we see up there, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And he said. But but what he also said it was that that would also discourage him maybe from talking about how he was feeling with his friends because he would think everybody else is fine. How can I say I'm not doing OK? So that awareness that, you know, appearances are, 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 are one thing, you know, and, and we never know what's going on for people. And it's really important that we are uh, there for each other and that we support each other and that we are honest in the conversations that we have with the people around us. Um, and I think that's that's such a hugely powerful um, thing for us to, to talk about and share today. Um, so I just am going to check in to see if we have any questions in the questions and answers uh, session. Uh, questions and answers. I, I can't access it here, actually. Um, and I'm also just going to share my closing slides, too. So. That's not going. Um, Barry, uh, Barry Murphy. Can you see the Q&A? Yeah, there was a question just about making the slides available. I think Art will made made slides be available. Yeah, no problem at all. Okay. No problem, we can do that. Um, okay, I'm just gonna share these last few just so people have. So can you see the, can you see the slide there? Yeah. Um, so just, just some closing uh, remarks, just a reminder that uh, the hashtag to use for social media is hashtag EDAW2023. Uh, and um, just to let people know as well, just a reminder of that very uh, positive message of hope that full recovery is possible and people are certainly not alone, that there's pe there are people out there who really understand what you're going through. If you are unsure of who to contact or what the support services are in your own local area, that you can contact BodyWise. So the BodyWise support services that we have are we have a BodyWise helpline. We also have a support email. We have an online support group. Uh, we have one for over 18s and under 18s. And um, we have two different websites. So I know I mentioned this already, but just to re reiterate, and um, we have a website uh, dedicated to eating disorders, so bodywise.ie. And then we also have the body image website, which is lots of valuable resources and videos and podcasts and um, different information. And the youth section of that was developed in collaboration with young people. Um, and it's through the body image website as well that you can access the, the school's programs. So um, we have also a program for parents, peer led resilience program, a four week program, um, which is practical. And it touches on uh, Connor, um, you mentioned in particular that the the um the pressure that can be on families supporting a child uh, or young person with an eating disorder. So the peer-led resilience program is really um, effective in doing that. And then we have our schools uh, programs as well. So um, the More Than a Selfie program that we uh, have piloted in a number of schools nationwide, um, one all-male, one uh, all-female school and one mixed school, um, got very, very positive feedback. So it's a four-week program. Male participants in particular um, responded very positively to the program and actually we affected more change within the male participant group and um, which was was really uh, brilliant and I attribute that uh, to the fact that we collaborated very closely with young people in the development of the resources and included videos of young people talking about body image pressure so young males and some of the feedback here so 89.5% of male participants said that the program was good for their class so these were all on anonymous and confidential feedback forms um, and 86.5% said that they would recommend the program for younger friends or siblings and just some comments there that you can see from youth participants. Uh, one of the boys, uh, age 13, said, learning about how you have to be yourself and not let others change you or you won't be happy. It was very interesting. And another boy said that there are groups to help if ever I need it. It fills me with confidence. 
So just some positive feedback there. Also to let uh, teachers know that we have the Happy To Be Me program for primary schools as well. Um, it doesn't broach eating disorders at all. It is just around promoting positive body image and self-esteem and feedback from teachers on the resources well, um, just included there is the lessons are very well pitched, age appropriate and full of varied activities that children uh, that will engage the children. And also uh, another teacher indicated this is really set within an Irish context and meeting a definite, definite need. Uh, and these uh, programs are all um, available online and um, via the bodywisebodyimage.ie uh, website. So just uh, a final thank you to everybody who joined us today. Um, and thank you also for supporting Eating Disorders Awareness Week um, 2023. And we're really delighted to have your support and to open this very, very important conversation around breaking the stigma um, and opening up to discuss male body image and eating disorders. So thank you very much. <laughs>